In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can I consider the gospel again tonight that uh, we considered not that long ago on the feast of the confession of St. Peter, or yes, of St. Peter, uh, but specifically these words, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this particular scripture has in it great words of comfort for you and for me. It is Matthew's institution of what we call the office of the keys, that special authority which Christ has given to his church to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Now, in the catechism, we are asked then, where is this written? And it's what the holy evangelist St. John writes in John chapter 20, the Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then very similar words. Whosoever sins you, plural, forgive, they are forgiven them. Whoever sins you do not forgive, they are not forgiven them. What's important to note here is that in John's account, uh, again, it's you, plural. We don't really talk that way in English, do we? Uh, But here the Southerners have it right when they say y'all. You all, right? So in John's account, the office of the keys is given to all the disciples there gathered, the 11, in the upper room on um, eight days after our Lord's resurrection. Here in this account, it's given specifically, uh, spoken to Peter. And that has caused no end of abuse. Opportunity was, uh, was apparent then to the Church of Rome in particular, who saw there the opportunity to ground their church or ecclesiastical authority not in the apostolic mandates to go and baptize and to teach, to absolve and to forgive sins, to administer the sacrament according to the Lord's command. Those things clearly are given elsewhere to, well, first to the apostles and thereby to the whole church. But they saw the opportunity here where it is spoken in the singular, I give you, that is Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you, singular, plural, or not plural, you, Peter, loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I don't think these two texts are in conflict with each other, but again, the Church of Rome saw an opportunity here um, to ground their authority in not just any of the apostles, but quite specifically in what they would call the chief of the apostles, the one who's usually their spokesperson, the spokesperson, and that is St. Peter. This is why at the time of the Reformation, the Church of Rome decided to build a large basilica in the Vatican um, to St. Peter, St. Peter's Basilica, which was funded by, famously, at the time of the Reformation, you know this, by the indulgences. But that's an important note because by taking this text from Matthew 16 and saying that forgiveness of sins is bound to Peter specifically and only then by extension to the other apostles and not given to the church at large, they were able to control the distribution of forgiveness. Rather than that forgiveness breaking out whenever and wherever the Lord chooses to give it, whether it be um, spoken by the pastor and uh, to the congregation in divine service or from the pulpit, uh, whether it's given in baptism or in the Lord's Supper, whether it's spoken by husband to wife or wife to husband or parents to children, or even workers, co-workers to one another, or employer to worker, or even forgiving civil leaders for their sins when they are repentant. That's the vision that the Lord has, and that's the great gift of forgiveness. And it is the work of the church to proclaim forgiveness to all. And yet, again, the Church of Rome saw a way of taking hold of that forgiveness and distributing it either on the basis of financial contributions in the case of indulgences, or in some cases with political motivation to those who they chose to give it to and withholding that forgiveness from those whom they disliked for political gain. And so they commanded to themselves an authority that God had not given. And to that point then, our Lutheran confessions um, have a whole article that primarily deals with this text. And it's not one that, I've, uh, that we've read together or I've shared with you, 
Um, but it is called the Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope. Have you heard of it? Okay. Yeah, anytime we have an installation, ordination, um, you'll hear it when the, t when the teachers are reinstalled in a week, a week from Sunday. Uh, the Treatise, written by Luther, is, well, it is a mag magnum opus on, really, the papacy and all of its errors. And there's a whole section just on this Matthew text. I'm going to share a little bit with you, and you'll hear how the argument goes. They, that is the Church of Rome, cite against us certain passages, namely Matthew 16. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Also, I give you the keys. As well, John 21, feed my lambs and some others. Since this entire controversy has been fully and accurately treated elsewhere in the books of our theologians, and there Luther is referring to the Augsburg Confession and elsewhere, everything cannot be reviewed here. We refer to those writings and wish them to be considered repeated here. Yet, we will briefly reply about the interpretation of the passages above, namely our gospel text. In all these passages, Peter is the representative of the entire assembly of the apostles, as appears from the text itself. Christ does not ask Peter alone when he says, who do you say that I am? What is said here to Peter alone in the singular number, I will give you, singular, the keys, and whatever you, singular, bind, is elsewhere expressed in the plural. Whatever you, plural, bind, and whatever you, plural, forgive the sins of anyone, John 20. These words show that the keys are given to all the apostles alike and that all the apostles are sent forth alike, as I said a few minutes ago. In addition, it must be recognized that the keys belong not to the person of, an, of one particular man, but to the church. The keys belong to the church. Most, many most clear and firm arguments show this. For Christ, speaking about the keys, adds, for example, if two of you agree on earth, also our gospel text. Therefore, he grants the keys first and directly to the church. This is why it is first the church that has the right of calling. For just as the promise of the gospel belongs certainly and immediately to the entire church, so the keys belong immediately to the entire church, because the keys are nothing else than the office whereby this promise is communicated to everyone who desires it. Just as it is actually manifest that the church has the power to ordain ministers of the church. And Christ speaks in these words, whatsoever you shall bind, etc., and indicates to whom he has given the keys, namely to the church, where two or three are gathered in my name. Likewise, Christ gives supreme and final jurisdiction to the church when he says, tell it to the church. Therefore, these passages demonstrate that Peter is the representative of the entire assembly of the apostles. They do not grant Peter any privilege or superiority or lordship. As for the declaration on this rock, I will build my church, certainly the church has not been built upon the authority of a man. Rather, it has been built upon the ministry of the confession Peter made, in which he proclaims that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Therefore, Christ addresses Peter as a minister on this rock, that is, on this ministry. Therefore, he addresses him as a minister of this office in which this confession and doctrine is to be in operation and says, upon this rock, that is, this preaching and preaching office. Furthermore, the ministry of the New Testament is not bound to places and persons like the Levitical ministry was, the Old Testament ministry. Rather, it is spread throughout the whole world. That is where God gives his gifts, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers. Nor does this ministry work because of the authority of any person, but because of the word given by Christ. Nor does the person add anything to this word or office. It matters not who is preaching and teaching it. If there are hearts who receive and cling to it, to them it is as they hear and believe. I could keep going. <laughs> he quotes some other texts and also some of the church fathers. So you hear that our Lutheran confession is careful not only to properly understand the text from its clear meaning, not trying to impose a meaning upon it, simply to command some ungiven authority and then exercise that authority uh, for fundraising and other kinds of spiritual abuse. But Luther and the other confessors are quite careful to articulate the scriptures accurately so that the gift that the Lord desires to give is not withheld from you. The, go the goal here is not that 
we be stingy with the gifts that the Lord gives, but rather that we would commend those um, who are here and even those who aren't here to receive these gifts frequently and regularly without limit, without imposition, that the cup of the Lord would overflow in grace and mercy for them. There's not such a thing as having too much of the forgiveness of sins. It doesn't become less special or less important the more you hear it and receive it. Instead, the more we hear of the forgiveness of sins, the more we know our need for that forgiveness because coupled with forgiveness, of course, is the proclamation of God's law, which shows us our sin and our need to be forgiven daily and richly. And so the, the gift here is that Peter is, well, not taking on an authority of his own. He's not commanding, but rather he is receiving. And as Peter receives, then he is to give, which is the whole life of the Christian. We heard this in the epistle. All of the various gifts that the Lord gives to the members of the body, each living stones built up into his church, each of them received their gifts in order to be used for the benefit of their neighbor. So Peter receives the office of the ministry, not to be a superior Christian, elevated above, a clerical class that is more important than those in the pew, the laity, but rather he is given this authority in order to distribute the gifts of God, to be a servant, which is why Jesus washed his feet to anoint him as one who would preach the good news to the poor, just as Jesus himself had done. And that's why Jesus was careful, and I think Rome missed this point, to articulate that everything that Peter said and everything that he was given was gift to him. Even the confession that he made, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, was revealed to him, not by his own flesh and blood, not from his mind or his wisdom or his intellect or his insight or perceptions, but rather it was revealed to him by the Father who is in heaven. And of course, that's the whole nature of the church. God reveals to us the church. He institutes the offices of preacher and teacher in the church in order that the gifts would be distributed, again, according to his word. All of this being a gift revealed by the word, not a gift that's commanded or taken unto oneself, but one that is received with humility and always for the benefit of those who need to receive. In this case, the loosing of sins, not only here on earth, but ultimately before God in heaven. Forgiven, restored, and with that comes then resurrection and life everlasting. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Amen. We stand to